Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to introduce the concept of the structure conduct performance paradigm and then just talk about the first part of that, which is structure. Just to get us started, what we're going to do this week is introduce the field of industrial economics, also known as industrial organization, or just IO for short. IO is the study of markets and the firms that inhabit them. We're going to look at different market structures and how firms are going to behave differently across those market structures and how the ultimate outcomes for the firms and society as a whole depend on those structures. The purpose of this week's material is mostly to set the stage for the coming weeks talking about industrial organization. This is my field, so I am excited to get into that. Industrial organization is very important to managers because managers may find themselves in many different market structures and different market conditions, and that's going to affect the optimal decisions that those managers make, and it's going to affect the profit that the firms will make as well. We might think about a sample IO type question, which would be, how do pricing and advertising decisions differ for monopolies and oligopolies? Of course, one of the big differences there is monopolies have one firm, oligopolies have a number of firms, and as such, the monopoly has more market power. They're going to make a different kind of pricing decision than the oligopolies. Advertising is much different for a monopoly because they're the only one in the market, whereas oligopolies might be interested in stealing away customers from their rivals. We're going to frame much of our discussion in the coming weeks here using the Structure Conduct Performance Paradigm, or SCP for short. SCP is the framework upon which the field of industrial organization was originally built. While modern industrial economists don't necessarily stick to it perfectly like they used to, it's still a very useful framework to think about all the different features of a market and what goes on in them. The idea of SCP is that we start with the market structure, and these are the underlying features of the market, and then move on to how those structures affect the conduct of the firms. That's things like pricing and other decisions that the firms make. And then we finally examine the performance of the market, measured by the profit and the total welfare of society that comes about through those structures and conduct together. I'm going to start here talking about market structure. We'll talk about a few different features of market structure, and I want you to keep these things in mind as we move forward through the next few weeks to think about how these features, these underlying fundamental features of a market, actually affect what goes on. We're going to look at the number of firms in the market, the relative size of the firms, the technology that's available, as well as the cost, We'll examine demand and then the barriers or potentially lack of barriers to entry. It's really important to look at these things because market structure is key to decision making, which is going to come in our next topic, which is conduct. Let's start out with firm size. Some industries are dominated by very large firms. Other industries have lots of small firms. Other industries still have some of each. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the concept of economies of scale and economies of scope. In some industries, firms that are big tend to be more efficient. In some other industries, firms that are small tend to be more efficient. Within the same industry, there might be large sm firms and small firms, and they might behave differently. The large firms might end up having some leadership power that the small firms have to follow. Another interesting question relating to firm size is where the innovation in the industry comes from. Is it from the large firms who are well set up and are able to easily fund innovation? Or is it from the small firms who are trying to do everything they can to displace the larger firms in the industry? We might also ask the question of how did the large firms become so large? Is it because they were simply the first one there or is it because they are the most efficient of all the competitors? These are all interesting questions that industrial organization aims to answer. Concentration of an industry is one of the most important and interesting aspects of its structure. When we talk about an industry's concentration, we want to know how is the output in the industry distributed among the players in that industry. Some industries have many small firms, and those are industries we would say are not very concentrated, as the output is spread out among uh, many different suppliers, whereas in other industries we have only a few 
very large firms, and those are ones we say are more concentrated, where the output is mostly in the hands of a few dominant players. Next week, we're going to talk about the most extreme situations when, we, when it comes to concentration, perfectly competitive markets that have this lowest possible concentration, and of course, monopolies, which are single firm industries, are the most concentrated that we can be. If we think about industries in real life, true monopolies and true perfect competition are, are very rare. Perfectly competitive industries possibly don't even exist at all. Most industries in real life are somewhere in between there. And that's really the meat and potatoes of industrial organization. Thinking about what happens when industries are imperfectly competitive. Let's talk about a few different ways to measure concentration in an industry. The first one is relatively simple, and that's what we call the concentration ratio, or CR for short. The concentration ratio is simply the total output of an industry that is produced by the largest N firms, where N is a number that you pick. To calculate the concentration ratio for the top N firms, we simply add up the market share of the top N firms. You can put any number you want. You can have CR3, you can have CR10, you can do whatever you like. However, the four firm concentration ratio, or the CR4, is a pretty common one that is used. Calculating this is fairly simple. All we need to do is first we let WI be the market share of firm I. I'm going to be using this type of language quite a bit throughout the next few weeks, so it's helpful to get used to what I mean by that. When we talk about the firms in an industry, I use firm I as a way to just talk about a generic firm. Maybe there's 10 firms in the industry, firm I could be firm 1, it could be firm 2, it could be firm 3. Talking about the mobile phone industry, firm I could be Apple, it could be Samsung, it could be any of those. I'm just talking about a generic firm here. Mathematically, how we do the concentration ratio is simply adding up the market shares, or the WI, for the biggest N firms. So here I can be 1, it can be 2, all the way up to N, and we just add all of those up. One thing to remember about the concentration ratio is, if we calculate, for example, the CR4 and there's only three firms in the market, then that concentration ratio is 1. Likewise, if there are four firms in the market and we calculate the CR4, it's 1. One problem with the concentration ratio is it is a little bit crude. It doesn't really say anything about the structure of the industry past the top N firms. An alternative measure for concentration is called the herfindahl hirschman Index, or the HHI for short. The HHI, in, in many ways, is a bit more nuanced than the concentration ratio, and as such, it's a pretty popular way to talk about concentration. Calculating the HHI is not too difficult to do. All we need to do is square all of the market shares of every firm in the market add them up and multiply by 10,000. I'm again going to use WI as a generic firm's market share. And now I'm going to use capital N to be the total number of firms. You'll notice that before in the concentration ratio I was using a lowercase n to indicate that that was the top firms as opposed to all the firms. So capital N refers to all of the firms in the market. I'm going to be using that notation throughout the rest of the course. The way that we calculate the HHI mathematically, have all our WIs, square them, add those up, and then multiply it by 10,000. What the squaring does is makes large market shares increase the HHI very, very quickly, whereas very small market shares hardly contribute anything to the HHI, as very tiny numbers squared are basically zero, whereas big numbers squared are bigger numbers. Note that the highest possible HHI is going to happen in the most concentrated possible situation, which of course is a monopoly, when the total number of firms is 1. So then we're going to just get 1 squared times 10,000, that's 10,000. Let's do an example of calculating concentration ratio and HHI. I've hopped over to Excel here, and what I have is the market shares for the 10 largest automakers in the United States. One thing that we might notice right from the beginning is if I add up the sum of all of these, we're going to get 94.8%, 0.948. Of course, there are more than 10 automakers in the United States, but these are the 10 largest. 
First, I'm going to calculate the CR4, or the four firm concentration ratio for this industry. To do that, I'm going to take the sum of the four largest firms. What we get is 0.58. So about 58% of the auto industry is taken up by just GM, Ford, Toyota, and Fiat Chrysler. We could go on and do something like the CR5, and for that, I would simply add Nissan into that sum, and I get about 0.68. We could do this for any number here. Now, to do the HHI, what I'm going to do is first calculate the squared market share for each firm. So I'm going to take the market share and I'm going to square that. Now, for the HHI, I'm going to take the sum of those squares. And then the last step is just to multiply that by 10,000. So I'm going to get 1,138.84. One thing that I want to point out here in calculating both of these is that I've got the shares here in decimals as opposed to percentages. If I were to convert these to percentages, I would simply multiply each of these by 100. The reason that I'm showing you this is that to calculate the HHI, notice how I multiplied by 10,000 here. Why do we do that? Well, the reason that we do that is that it makes things consistent for people who want to calculate the HHI using the percentages. I'm going to add another column here for the squared percentages. You'll notice how the percentages are 100 times the decimal shares, and because the 100 gets squared as well, we have our squared percentages actually being 10,000 times our squared shares. So now if I want to calculate the HHI using the squared percentages, I simply take the sum of those. Now here, since I've already got the 10,000 baked in, I don't need to multiply by 10,000 to get the exact same answer. I will point out that our book does it this way, but there are some textbooks and some sources that actually do the HHI without multiplying by 10,000. So if you see an article talking about HHI and they have something that is much smaller than, than you are used to, then they're still talking about the same thing. So somebody might say an HHI of 0.11, that's the same thing as an HHI of 1100 in the bigger scale. With the smaller scaled HHIs, they vary from zero in a completely unconcentrated industry to one in a monopoly instead of zero to 10,000. Like I said, it's doing the exact same thing. The last thing I wanna talk about for HHI in this example is to come back to this idea right here that our market shares that we have only add up to about 95%. So there's still 5% of the industry out there and a bunch more firms that we have not accounted for. So really, to be technically correct, we really should have all of those market shares to actually properly calculate the HHI. As you recall, we need to square and add up every single firm's market share, whereas here we only had 10. But actually, this is not that much of a problem. If I take 1 minus the market share that we have so far, we have about 5.2% left. Now suppose that I were to divide up that remaining market share into two firms. Each one would have a market share of 0 0.026, which is actually bigger than Daimler, so that's actually not possible. We know that they have to be smaller than Daimler, so let's divide it into three equally sized firms. What we get is about 1.7% market share, 
This is actually a pretty conservative estimate because there is probably more than three firms left that we haven't accounted for, and they're probably smaller than this even. But let's start out with that and see what happens to the HHI if we add these three fictional firms into the HHI. So to do that, I'm going to first square that market share, multiply it by three since there's three of these firms, and then multiply it by 10,000. What I get is nine. Now compare that to the HHI that we did get. Nine is just barely even scratching the surface of 1100, so really it's not a big deal that we didn't include these. The HHI that we calculated of 1138 is a low end. It's in reality higher than that, but not much higher than that. If, for example, that we thought that the rest of the market was 10 equally sized firms, then the answer we would get here would be an addition of only 2.7 to the HHI. So really, it's not going to make much of a difference. Let's talk about some examples of concentration ratios and HHIs for a few well-known industries. Notice up here at the top we've got two alcohol-based industries, so breweries and distilleries. These have a CR4 of 90 and 70. Very, very high, right? So that means that 90% of the beer industry is controlled by the four largest firms. With distilleries, it means the top four firms control 70% of the market, going down to computers, 87%, very high, right? And what we've seen in these industries, of course, is a lot of mergers and consolidation of firms under large holding companies. So this isn't really a surprise to me. If we go down to something like furniture, there's a lot of different competing brands, and we can see that the top four firms only control 11% of that industry. Let's compare some of these HHIs. For distilleries, you can see that that's about 1,500. You might be wondering, what do we consider a big HHI? And well, the answer to that really is, it's all relative. What we want to do is compare the HHI across different industries and use that to say, well, do we think that this industry is more concentrated than another? So here we could say that the milk industry is less concentrated than the distilleries as it has a lower HHI and we can also see it has a lower concentration ratio. Now I also want to point out here that those two numbers don't have to agree, although in most cases they will. For example, if we compare these two industries here, snack foods and soft drinks, their CR4 is almost exactly the same, yet the snack food industry has a substantially higher HHI than soft drinks. In fact, it's the biggest one on this list. I'll also point out here that our motor vehicles HHI here is 1700, whereas the one we calculated was a bit smaller than that. But as you can see here, our data in this table is a lot older. So I didn't mention it before, but the data that I used in the previous calculation was 2017, whereas this is 2007. So things can obviously change over time. 